designed to be the smallest possible airframe to be mated with the 2,250 horsepower R2800 radial engine, the Chancevoit Corsair was ordered in such great numbers that its production had to be subcontracted out to various companies, among them Goodyear Aircraft. Before being modified and accepted for carrier use, the Corsair was assigned to Marine squadrons in the South Pacific where it would soon prove itself to be as tough as the Marines who flew it. The fighter-bomber excelled not only in air-to-air -air combat, it proved to be a devastatingly accurate ground attack airplane. Japanese ground troops nicknamed the Corsair Whistling Death. It would prove its worth in Korea as well, serving as an especially effective close air support platform. The Cavanaugh Flight Museum's FG-1D Corsair IV was originally built by Goodyear for the Royal Navy. But when the order was canceled towards the end of the war, it was added to the U.S. Navy inventory. It's painted in the markings of the Corsair flown by Major Archie Donahue when he served with BMF-211 at Guadalcanal in 1943. Donahue is one of only seven Marine pilots to destroy five aircraft in one engagement. He would end the war with 14 aerial victories. The Cavanaugh Flight Museum, located just north of Dallas, Texas, is one of the nation's premier aviation museums and a frequent contributor to Warbirds in Review. Jim Cavanaugh, the museum's founder, and Doug Jaynes, the museum's director, will tell us, in their own words, what it took to restore this iconic warbird. We are very fortunate today. The airplane of the day is, uh, I hate to say this with my wife in the audience perhaps, and that this is my girlfriend, always has been. I love the Corsair. If, if you have to have one airplane, that, that's the one I would have to fly. It's, it's really great. But we do have this beautiful example of a, an early model Corsair from the Kavanaugh Flight Museum, which is at Addison Airport in Dallas, Texas. If you ever get a chance, don't miss it. Jim Cavanaugh has put together a marvelous program of education, and he's done great. And his executive director is with us today, Doug Jeans. Doug, we'll turn it over to you, and then we'll talk a bit about Corsairs. Okay, sure will. Thanks, Bill. Um, this is also Stuart Milson. He's our chief pilot, so he's going to talk about it a little bit. We want to sit down? All right, we'll do that. I'm old. <laughs> well, just talk a little bit about the, the markings on it first, because uh, as Bill said, it's uh, made up as an early model. Uh, kind of the history of the airplane in the 50s or so, it was surplused out, and a fellow bought two of them for $2,500 from the, from the government, and uh, kind of messed around with them. They sat a lot, and then another guy got them, and in the late 60s, he had some young young guy, 24, that was, wasn't young compared to most pilots at that time, but uh, fly it for the first time back from an air show, and he uh, t took off without the tailwheel being locked, and uh, I've done that before, but uh, it's not, not fun. But, it's a uh, wild ride. It's a wild ride. It wasn't bad on takeoff as a landing that was wild, but uh, that's when I realized it. But uh, anyway, rolled it up in a ball, and uh, it sat for a long time. Another fellow picked it up, uh, Harry Doan actually uh, got it, and went looking for a set of wings and found what we always thought were Dash 5 wings. There's a Dash 5 sitting out here. It has the uh, 20 millimeter cannons on it. Um, but, but in actuality, these are Dash 4B wings. So the Dash 4 actually had uh, the B model, had the 20 millimeter cannons. Well, back in the uh, early years with the, the Corsair, the F4U, they built a 1C model, and the C had 20 millimeter cannons. The difference was the barrels stick out far. If you look at this one compared to the Dash 5, the barrels are sticking way out. So when we were doing our last restoration on it, decided to do something a little different since it didn't have the right wings to begin with, 
So we extended the barrels out uh, to make it look like a 1C. So if you're looking at it and say 1C, what is that? That's how it's done. Quick question for you. Sure. Did, did the 1C have metal covered aft section? Of no, the it still had the uh, still fabric. Still had the fabric? Yeah, still had fabric, okay. like, like the earlier ones. Um, so going, going back through the history of the airplane, so it kind of came along, uh, a guy named Charles Arsburn bought it, restored it uh, through the years, and then a fellow in Louisiana named David Johnson bought it and uh, had it down in Lafayette. And I met David uh, sometime in the 90s and at ICAST, which is an air show convention, and uh, David asked me, he said, Doug, would you like to fly the Corsair? And I said, sure. So uh, I ran into him a few months later, and he said, uh, hey, are you ever going to fly my Corsair? And I said, well, golly, I didn't know you were serious. I just thought that was an awful nice offer. So uh, Alan Henley, that's with the uh, Aeroshell team, uh, kind of headed it up. He checked me out in it, and that was a lot of fun. It's a great airplane to fly. So we flew it around uh, for a while, and then uh, Mike Burke, who flies a lot of Corsairs for different people, was taking it to an air show. I'm going to back up is David Johnson sold it to uh, Paul Morgan out of England. So I took it down to Florida for Paul to fly it and ride in it and I got to meet him and his wife and uh, just had a great weekend with them all. He bought it, took it to over to Europe and uh, he was killed in a, a Sea Fury accident. So his wife called me up and said, Doug, Paul really enjoyed flying with you, this has back seat. Enjoyed flying with you, knew, knew how much you loved the airplane. It, you know, since he's gone, we're going to sell the airplane. I'd really like for you to have it. Well, I wasn't in any kind of way to be able to buy it. So uh, talked to Mr. Cavanaugh. Mr. Cavanaugh got it, brought it over, and uh, rebuilt it or finished it up, painted it, got it going. And Mike Burke was flying it to an air show. It had an oil cooler split. Now, the oil cooler, as you can see, is in the leading edge of the wing. Well, the oil goes out you can't see it it's just kind of out of sight so just all of a sudden the engine ran away seized up he did a great job putting it into a plowed field so we brought it back started rebuilding it so since we we're going to repaint it we decided to come up that's when we decided to make it into the sea and uh, repainted it so uh, Archie Donahue was an ace in a day twice in Corsairs once in Guadalcanal which you know with the VMF 1, uh, 112 which is how it's painted and then later on the Bunker Hill and so uh, I met Archie again back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, and uh, he helped me. He was with the CAF. He was uh, head of operations, and he kind of took me under his wing and, and taught me a lot of things. And it, it was 10, 15 years later that I realized that he was an ace or famous or anything. I didn't know. He was just a great guy. So I wanted to honor him. So we painted it up to my, uh, in his markings. He came out, got in the airplane, and uh, we just had – one engine problem after another, and it took us about six, seven years to finally get up and fly, and up and flying. And uh, Archie passed away in the meantime, but uh, we have it there as an honor to him. Um, I don't know if any of y'all have gotten the latest Warbird Digest, but there's a great, great article all about the airplane, and uh, it just came out. Ought to be on sale somewhere. But uh, so we, you know, we've had it now up and going for uh, three or four months. Got some time on it. It is on the rides program. It's the only Corsair, I think, right now that's available for to do rides. So if you've got that on your bucket list, that's an airplane to. You have a back seat, don't you? It has a back seat, and it's on the FAA rides program, so we're able to do rides that's, with it. That's really great. That was one of the limitations of the single seat airplanes like the Corsair was that you couldn't share it with anybody. Yeah. And and it's one of those airplanes you really want to share because it is just it's just such a superb flying machine. It's it's wonderful to fly. Uh, it's I guess all three of us know and a couple others, but uh, it's a it's a lot of fun. It's it's actually fairly. I think it's kind of easy compared Easier to most warbirds. I think it is. I, don't I know. think so too. But uh, you know, just got to get over the long nose on it, and uh, you know, one of the little odd things about it, I guess, is because of the long nose, it's got a, a lockable tail wheel. So on landings, where when the tail wheel touches down, wherever the nose is pointed, that's where it's going to go. So that's Sometimes it'll give you a little jolt, but it's got plenty of rudder to get it back. Yeah, okay. it's just it's just a it's an honest airplane. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, flies what great. Are, what are the major differences would you say between this airplane and I know we've got an F4U4 and an F4U5, 
The only other one that I know of that we don't have is an F4U7. We don't. Right. That's there's not, only a couple of those around. Yeah. I think. Uh, the seven was the last mile. They built the. How long did they build Corsair? Well, up into the 50s. So I think late 52, 50s. I, yeah. I right. think it might even be a little later because they built them for the uh, for the French. Do you know that, Stuart? Okay. Yeah, they built. They started building for the French. They did the. Uh, I was like an something an oddball deal, like an A7 or yeah. something kind of weird number. But uh, the main difference is the uh, the F4U-1 and the FG1D, which is this is, are, are the same. That was kind of the earlier model. Um, Chance Vought designed and, and built the airplane, and then they uh, excuse, yeah, and then they wanted to move on to a couple other things and uh, make different models. But they contracted with Goodyear to build the Dash One model. Well, because they were under contract. They couldn't make any modifications or changes to it, so Goodyear only made the Dash One model, right? As the FG1D, which was for Goodyear. When did they get away from the birdcage canopy? The early F4U1s uh, had a right. multifaceted canopy that was a little hard to see out of. It was hard to see out of, and that was one of the things, as we know, that with that in the landing gear, um, coming aboard carrier, they, they had a hard time seeing the carrier. The early landing gear tended to bounce and they'd miss the, the cable, so they had a lot of problems. So they uh, gave them over to the Marines to fly off the islands. But the D model came, had the bubble canopy and uh, made it a little bit more, a little easier to see out of. They raised the seat up a little bit and uh, put a lot more forgiving uh, landing gear on it. I, uh, when Alan was checking me out and he said, you know, you can't do a bad landing in it. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can prove him wrong. Well, yeah, you can. Uh, but the gear, you know, I've always watched guys land. If you watch Corsairs land, the wheels just touch down and, and just squeak on kind of usually. And the gear gives so much that when you're watching an airplane land, you only look at its wheels. You never look at the airplane. But the wheels can be on the ground. The airplane can be doing, going all over the place, but the wheels don't leave the ground. And that's what happens a few times. I had uh, one pretty hard landing in it, stalled it a few feet off the ground and kind of oh. slammed it in, thought this is it. And there's a probably as many people as you standing there. Some flying going off the airport. That's what kind of got me a little uptight. I only had about five hours in it, and uh, I thought, oh, I'm rolling it into a ball right in front of all these people. And next thing I knew, I was just rolling down there, and everybody came out. So that was the greatest landing I ever saw. So should have I mean, been should have been in here. How many pilots are here? How many of you are pilots? Mm -hmm. Then you you know what the shock struts are on the gear. And if you'll look at these and you don't know what you're looking at, you'll think that these need to be pumped up because you don't see any polish. And in almost every uh, hydraulically cushioned landing gear, you, you see polished struts. And Corsair, you better not pump enough, put enough nitrogen in it to, sh to show a, a polished strut or you're in trouble. Right. Yeah, this has kind of a uh, orifice chamber type uh, mechanism in there that as it, go as it absorbs, it doesn't come back. It just keeps taking everything it has and just slowly kind of comes down and settles down on the on the gear. So that's what gives you that nice little touchdown, typically. So I'm gonna get, let Stuart talk about flying it. He's our, our chief pilot and uh, does our check rides in, in house and uh, flies just about everything we have. So Stuart, you want to talk about it a little bit? Well, first off, I'm honored to uh, to get to get to fly the airplane. Um, I'm very partial to the to the Corsairs. Um, been fortunate to fly. Um, most of the World War II fighters, and the first fighter I checked out in was the CAF Corsair, uh, which is also an FG-1D. And um, flown five different airframes, um, flown the fours and the fives, and uh, these early model airplanes, in, in my opinion, fly the best. Uh, they're, it's, it's like a Bonanza or a Cessna, you know, they're the lightest of the, of the ones. Uh, they're very quiet, the exhaust, you see goes goes underneath the airplanes where on the fours and the fives it's uh it's on the side and um very nice airplane uh, on the landing the one thing that you do have to watch out for is um if you look at when the wings are down in a crosswind you always have air under the wing so uh it can get squirrely and the uh, the, the uncomfortable part of it is is like they've said the wheels are on the ground but a wing will start to rise up, and it can get ugly quick. Bill, what what uh, model did you fly? I've flown the the fours, fives, and FG one Ds just just like you. I and I I agree with you. I think the FG one D is far and away the most pleasant airplane to fly. 
and it, uh, it 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 just doesn't have any bad vices except one, that the updraft carburetor. Right. And it and I had a nice fire one day, and one of my friends was standing out there as a fire guard. When you start a radial engine, you'll see somebody standing out there who's supposed to be knowledgeable and who has a, a fire extinguisher. That's the way you're supposed to do it. Well, I had my friend out there with a fire extinguisher standing there. The one thing I didn't have was a knowledgeable friend. And and I, I saw smoke coming as I was turning it over, and so I leaned away from my microphone and said, it, is, it, is it on fire? And he said, yeah. <laughs> and that's all there was to it. Use the damn fire extinguisher. So, but it, but they did change. Most of the others are, are a different carbureted system. I've flown one of those. Uh, I actually had to, I delivered one. I picked, picked one up with that updraft carburetor from California and uh, ended up going all the way across the United States into um, Canada with it. And, uh, of course, it broke several times along the way, but I was just petrified because I talked to guys about a fire and, you know, knock on wood, I, I was able to make it all the way with, without doing it. But uh, when I delivered the airplane, um, it's kind of comical. They had that thing on fire. I mean, <laughs> the first the first two or three days, I mean, we were all out there trying to start it. and um, But they figured it out, and they're doing great with the airplane. Well, it's supposed to start quick. It just sometimes doesn't do that. These, these airplanes were used by a number of, of Middle American, South American, whatever you want to call it, countries in the their rebellion, and one I had had a bullet hole in it, and I never patched it because it was my only proof that it was a true war veteran. But it it's a it, it's really one of those great airplanes that you just can't help but smile when you when you climb in it. I'm gonna tell you just a quick story. I, it it mo a lot of these were flown by the Marines for the simple reason that the uh, gull wing and the big engine and made it where they were scared of flying it on the boat initially until they learned how to do it and made a few changes in procedures but the the if you see marines who were on guadalcanal if you ever talk to one they'll they'll look at the that airplane and say it saved my you know what and they really i had one at uh, the talakoa fly in in tulsa or, and the, uh, there was an older Marine there. There are no ex-Marines, as I'm sure, and no apology to any Marine, but he was very feeble, and I, and I said, would you like to get in the cockpit? You know, you don't do that because people can push the wrong button at the wrong time, but I thought it'd really be nice if he could get there since it saved him. And he said, well, I'm too feeble. I'm just scared to get up there. He, I said, well, we can lift you up there. He was still, he was reluctant. I said, well, would you like to see it fly? And I wasn't scheduled to fly it. So I decided I would fly it for him. And I, I took off, and, and I mean, the tears were streaming down his face. It was just, it's unbelievable how they feel, how the grunt land-based Marines who were who on Guadalcanal or Okinawa feel about Corsairs. They love them. Yeah, most of them, I mean, they all do. Everybody that's ever flown a Corsair loves it. Uh, Archie, as I said, was ace in a day twice with Corsairs. Uh, he ended up with uh, 14 kills altogether. And uh, he loved the airplane. He talked about it a lot. We got him up in there, and it was the same type of deal. We had his family there, took family shots. There's a photo in this article of uh, Archie and I sitting by it, and or Archie in it. And uh, he was really a neat, really neat guy. Uh, Y'all were talking about the carburetors. Um, originally, they had an updraft carburetor, uh, 2800 Pratt and Whitney. Uh, most of them, this one and most others, have been converted to a uh, CB series engine, which is a transport engine, has a downdraft carburetor. So that's the difference we were talking about. So you can imagine a lot of airplanes, uh, civilian airplanes, have updraft carburetors, but on these, you, you flood them. Basically, you, know, you see the guys out there with their thumbs, and, and the thumb down means you're wet, thumbs up, you're dry. So you prime it until fuel comes out, as thumbs down, and then you, you start the ignition and all, and uh, it should start um, until it's dry. But with the updraft, because you're trying to suck fuel up and gravity's trying to pull it down, if you don't get it turning quick enough or don't get things going right, it's real easy to flood it and then all the fuel come out on the ground. And uh, Stuart was talking about being scared of, of um, 
having a fire, but he came through with that one. He was taking Canada into Addison and had it out there, and one of our younger mechanics was out there starting him and didn't realize the difference between the updraft and the downdraft, and he did get a little fuel, and it just caught just for a second and just scared the hell out of him because he'd never seen anything like that. So. Let's ask that. There's one typical question about Corsairs, and that why does it have inverted gull wings? What's your understanding? Uh, my understanding was, uh, you know, for the prop clearance. For what? The prop clearance. Well, they put longer gear on a on a, a Bearcat, and it has the same big engine, and they didn't put the gull wing. What's your understanding? There, there is a lot of disagreement as to why. What, what I understood was that Hamilton uh, originally designed this new prop. They had to have a bigger engine to turn it, so they came up with the 2800. Then they needed an airplane that was big enough to take it, and with the longer gear with the straight wing, it was too gangly to be on a carrier. So they decided to invert the, the gull, or invert the wing into the inverted gull wing so that it had the struts were shorter so that they wouldn't bounce as much and, and have more clearance. I, that's, that's probably true. I, I don't know. Every, I've, there's been an argument ever since there were Corsairs, but one of the other advantages is, is that if you look at the a point where the wing attaches to the fuselage, it's a right angle attachment, which is the lowest drag. If there's an angle to it on the, the where it attaches to the fuselage, it produces higher drag. So it did gain something. It gained ground clearance. It gained reducing in uh, uh, friction, and so it it's it worked out well, I think. I think it made it fly really good for sure. I yeah. Mean, even at slow speeds, high speeds, it just flies great. The, the have you ever flown against a Mustang? I haven't. Have you flown? Yeah, you. I'm sure you have. Here you go. How did you do? Well, I mean, if if I'm gonna have a low fl a low fight, I want to be in this airplane right here because if you look at the wing, it's a very thick wing, uh, and this airplane was built for the low fight. I definitely take this airplane over a Mustang on a low. Yeah, you just have to challenge him to a time to climb contest. That's the only way. You know, set it at 5,000 feet, and you're going to win every time. So, have we got uh, questions from the audience? Yes. The wooden ailerons. Uh, it does have wooden ailerons. I really don't know a lot about the development of it. I know they're a pain to try to restore. Uh, there's a few guys that, that do it. And uh, it's really intricate. It's not just a piece of wood. There's a lot of little pieces and parts in there, and uh, they're 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 kind of difficult. Um, so there, there's a few guys out that around that make them and rebuild them. So. You know, they just I'm sure it was just uh, you know trying to to make it light, trying to make it uh, you know war essential materials and all that cut down on the metal. You know, they had originally had fabric wings, uh, fabric panels. I think uh, a couple of, yeah, the, the one right here, if you look at it, it the, the wing panels are fabric. You can see the stitching in there. And uh, later they went to metal. But uh, I've never really heard a, a good reason for that. But uh, I just know it's, it's not just a simple aileron. It's pretty intricate. Other questions? Yes. I can't. Where's my Danny? You around? The, uh, yeah. oh, Let Stuart talk about it. Torque. So that's about torque on a go around. Oh, okay. Uh, well, really, um, this this is one of the better airplanes if you're going to have a go around. In um, if you look at the uh, at the vertical on this, uh, a lot of people don't realize, but there's very little stationary vertical fin, and the whole rest of the thing is rudder. And I've had a situation where I've needed that rudder. Um, what'll kill you is is a Mustang. Look at a Mustang's rudder, and a go around in a Mustang is is much more dangerous than a go around in this airplane. And it's because you've got all that rudder back there. More questions? Three blades versus four blade prop. Well, as they developed. And, and got bigger, they could make a bigger prop and, and built more uh, horsepower engines. 
and uh, needed a bigger prop, so they couldn't go any longer on the blades, so they went to four blades. So the Dash 4 has four blades, the Dash 5 had four blades, but the earlier ones had three blades. So. Also supposedly smoother. Yeah, the more blades you have, the smoother it's going to be, and it's better for higher altitude, the more blades. Dan, you have a I do. What's your question? What's the cruising speed? <laughs> cruising speed. Well, I'll tell you, this is uh, the first first uh, fighter to achieve 400 miles an hour in level flight is, is the Corsair. Uh, obviously, we don't typically um, fly them like that, but uh, it's a great cross-country airplane. Um, just to compare it to the Mustang, uh, you know, guys our size, it's a huge cockpit. There's plenty of plates to places to put everything. Um, it's really comfortable. Normally we'll, we'll see, um, you know, over 200 knots over the ground, uh, the way we fly them and the power settings we use. The 400 miles an hour was at 30,000 feet, as I recall. Yeah, it was, it was way up there. Of course, you burn a lot of gas. You can go faster than, like Stuart was saying, but you're gonna burn a lot more gas. I got a- 10 uh, mile range without drop tanks. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, kind of a funny story. I was flying this one uh, down to Florida, and I was going by Pensacola, and of course I called in as Goodyear four five one Fox Golf, and I was talking to Pensacola, and an older guy, older controller was on there, and he said, uh, he said, uh, what, what kind of uh, Corsair are you? And I said, well, I'm Goodyear built, and and I had a hell of a tailwind. I was doing three hundred and thirty knots or so across the ground. I was really screaming along, and he goes, Goodyear, huh? I said, yeah. He goes. You a blimp? <laughs> <laughs> said, Have you ever seen a 300 knot blimp? He goes, no. I said, God. But sure. I thought being Pensacola, this guy probably knew his airplanes. He asked me which, which type it was. So, more questions, Danny? You see some? Over yeah. Here. Uh, go ahead. Fuel burn cross country. Uh, kind of optimum's about 80 gallons an hour. Um, you can push it up. That's what we were saying. You know, it's it kind of a good economy cruise. Um, economy. 80 economy gallons cruise, an hour. 80 gallons an hour. <laughs> you need a really big credit card to own a Corsair. Right. Yeah. You know, if you push it up, um, you know, takeoff power, it's uh, 250, 260 gallons at takeoff. So, you know, as soon as you get the gear up, get it cleaned up, and everything, you're going to come back on the power, try to get it. You know, climb, it's about 130, 140. Is that about right? Yeah, somewhere around there. So um, you want to get it back to cruise as quick as you can. More questions? Yeah, right here. Uh, in World War II, the Hellcat had a kill ratio of around, I think, 16 to 1. This had 11 to 1, I think. Yet at the end of the war, the Navy keep kept producing these, and these went on to fly in Korea. Why not the Hellcat? You know, I, I really don't know for sure. My, my thoughts are this could carry a lot more. It carry bombs or you know, rockets, things like that, or the Hellcat, I don't believe could. You've flown both. I haven't. Do, does that sound right to you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I think the Hellcat was pure, purely a fighter, and uh, this is more of a fighter bomber. And with that, one of the interesting things on the, uh, on the landing gear on the later models, the Dash 4s and Dash 5s, is, is the... Uh, Am I going to lose here? The oh. main gear are actually there a dive go. brake. And you have a setting on the gear handle on the fours and fives that you go to dive brake and the main gear come out, but the tail wheel doesn't. So you can just put it in a straight nose down dive and the, the mains will come out and act as a dive brake and uh, for bombing. So. Hmm? Next question. I got the guy over here. Excuse me. Split, your, split yourself, Danny. Is the pin titanium, and is there a G limit for the pin? I don't know of any uh, limit for the pin itself. Uh, you know, I'm sure there is, um, but the the G limit on it, nine, nine, yeah, nine positive. So next. Go ahead. It's how you get up. <laughs> Are there any F4U5s still flying? Yeah. yeah, there's one right over here. 
It's one. Uh, it doesn't have the radar dome on it. I don't no, believe, uh, and that, that's that's the way you expect to see a five is with the radar on it. Mm -hmm. Did you fly one? I would like to talk to you after the program, please. Well, you ought to come down here and talk. So. <laughs> that just to, just you know, since he brought it up, how many veterans do we have? I'd like all the veterans to stand up at this point and be recognized. Any war, any time, anywhere. Thank, thank you very much. That's, that's the reason we do this, is to honor you guys and what you did. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun with all these airplanes to bring them out and have the veterans, somebody come out and show their family, this is an airplane I flew or this is one I worked on. You know, I, I was the prop mechanic, yeah. armor, or whatever. That's that's makes and it all worthwhile. And that's a, that's the point I was trying to make with the reenactors. That you know, it, it, during war, I think it was nine support people for each person who was in combat. And and it's it's that's the way it is. You, there were a lot of people who worked their tails off day and night, keeping these things going. Well, that's just the uh, the mechanics and all. The, yeah. There, there was a study done I read uh, not too long ago that the British looked at, and for one Spitfire, there's 99 people in the chain. That included cooks and cleaners and paperwork people and all that. So for every Spitfire pilot, there was 99 people up the supply chain. So wow. that, that's amazing. More questions? Surely we haven't yep. been that informative. <laughs> Does your dual seat aircraft also have dual controls? No, it doesn't. It's just a seat. Actually, it was an add-on. Uh, the armor right. plate you you removed. Didn't right, you? we removed part. We, the armor plate's partially removed, cut out and around, um, and has a huge back seat back there. It, when you're looking at it, it doesn't look like much, but it's real roomy. It's got good sized windows and uh, you know headphones and all that back there. So, how about Danny? <laughs> That's our plant. That's <laughs> Scott. <laughs> Only uh, Corsair. Uh, the that I know of that's on the ride, the FAA approved rides program. So we do do rides in it. Um, it's available if any of you want to put that on your bucket list. Are you, are you doing any up here? or? Uh, we're not really not doing set them officially up set up. Yeah. We, we, we might be able to work one in here or there. Uh, the ride's 24.95. That's with the decimal point at the end, as Chuck says. But uh, that keeps the airplane going. Um, one, of, one of the amazing things about the, the Corsair, uh, I think, is, uh, you know, Everybody, the, the bucket list P-51, there's so many, uh, you know, everybody loves the P-51. It's a, the greatest thing after World War II. Well, God, there's, you know, got to be 200 of them or so flying. And the Corsair, there's 15 or so flying. So it's pretty rare. And uh, you can get rides in a Mustang. Uh, there's many of them out there doing rides, but this is the only one that you can do a, a ride in a Corsair. But the Corsairs, you know, the prices of them have just gone up so much. Yeah. Uh, it's just It's just nuts. It's we won't get into prices. It makes me, <laughs> makes me sick. If I could buy back every airplane I've ever sold for what I sold it for, I would, we could have retired earlier. But any, anyway, you have another question, Dan? Yeah. yeah. I guess the question is for the pilot. Okay. I'm just wondering between you, you use trash talks and uh, the Mustangs, and did you get any, any stuff with those Mustangs? <laughs> okay, the pilot, he wants to know if you trash talk Mustangs and if you've ever got into a scuffle with a Mustang. Oh, uh, we we have a lot of fun. You a know, Mustang we, uh, pilot. I'm sorry. Yeah, we hey we fly <laughs> Mustangs as well. Um, but yeah, I mean that's one of the fun things we get to do is is uh, I mean you get to do some trash talking and there you know there may or may not be some beers involved afterwards. But yeah, so you want to do your best against your buddies. I think the biggest advantage of a Mustang is that you can fly it with a white suit and expect it to be reasonable when you get out. You can't do that with a Corsair. That's true. You're going to get oil on you somewhere. Somehow, that's just, if you're not getting oil on you, you probably don't have enough oil in it. Yeah, talk about the, the difference in the airplanes. Uh, I've flown a P-47 also and had somebody ask me, you know, which is better? They were arguing, a big group was arguing about it. And I said, well, this P-47 shot down a Mustang in the soccer war, so that's the only thing I know of. So depends on the pilot, obviously. How about it? Any more questions, Danny? Yeah, he wants to know the difference in the engines in the different model Corsairs. Uh, they're all the same. 
it's all it's all a uh, 2800 you know Di- different dash numbers well different, yeah now different, these are all the cb3s most and different of different pa- different power out- output yeah, Thank if you, you have one of the early ones, um, yeah, it's not going to be as, as as powerful as the as the CB3s. Now, Bill, was there not a 4360 on one model of a Corsair? The F2G, which was what they call the corn cob Corsair. Right. Yeah, that was a super Corsair, and I think they only made like 12 of those. Uh, or So there's just a handful made, and of course, uh, there's been a couple of racing. They had the 4360. Uh, they, they brought... They designed that to come up with something to go against the uh, kamikazes, and in the meantime, the uh, uh, the Bearcat came out, and uh, a couple other things that uh, far out did the Super Corsair, so they, they stopped production. Yeah, we have a lady. Why is it called Whistling Death? I didn't hear it. Why, why, is, it why is it called, called Whistling Death? The whistling Death. The uh, if you look at the inlets on the uh, the oil cooler, and it's also inlets to the carburetor. And there, when you're in a, a dive or, or going high speed, there, it creates a whistle. And uh, when we're flying them during the air shows, we've got several of them here. This is, I think this is the most I've seen in a long time. But uh, you'll hear them on the pullout. There will be a definite whistle, and it's due to the inlets and the leading edge. It's quite impressive. It, it, it does whistle. What's Say again. What's VNE? What's V&E? Depends on how much guts you got, I guess. Yeah. Different, different ones are different. Like Stuart's saying 355, that sounds about right. There's, there's a little red line on there that you don't go towards. But Supposedly <laughs> it would do 400 It'll miles do 400. That's That's level. That's up at, at altitude and all that. But you're not going to be indicating no. th- that much when you're up at, at altitude. You're going to be indicating pretty low. So. Bill, uh, if I may, mm-hmm. I, I want to talk a little bit about Dr. Bill. Uh, I want to thank you, Bill, for being a moderator all these years. It has been my duty to schedule the moderators, and I think I did a wonderful job today. I'm not trying to rush you, uh, but anyway, I want to thank you, Bill. And Thank you. Actually, I have a lot of thanks for a lot of people because I've, have, I've had an opportunity to fly some truly great airplanes, and it, it's – but the main thing – is I have met truly great people. And it's not people who are famous. It's people like the ones who are sitting here who have this, who share my interest. And that Paul Pobrezny said it better than anybody I know. Paul always said, the airplanes got you here, but it's the people that bring you back. Absolutely. And we thank you all. Absolutely. Bill? Bill is a mover and shaker in the Warburg community. He has flown so many different types of airplanes, including the B-17 you see flying overhead here. That's the EA's airplane, aluminum overcast. And I was sitting home one day, 20 years ago, (laughs) and Bill called me at home, and he said, Danny, uh, understand that you've got quite a bit of radial engine time. I said, yeah, Bill, I flew him in the Air Force, and my first airliner was radial. He said, how much tailwheel time you got? My blood pressure went up. Because I knew, I knew where he was going. And he said, uh, would you like to fly the B-17? And I, I took about a micro millisecond to answer that, yes, hell yes. And I did it for 20 years, and it's been a wonderful experience. Thank you, Mr. Bill. Oh, you're welcome. Thank Anything else that we can tell you about Corsairs? Or, oh, there's one. Yes. Say, but you were asking about aircraft carriers. Oh, just about all of them, I think. So, <laughs> every, just about everything. That was yeah, the war to end all wars. They pushed remember? a lot of stuff over. Yeah. About four wars ago, that was the war that was to end all wars. Unfortunately, it didn't work. Uh, hundreds, I'd say. Don't really know. I know there was a lot of it done. Um, you know, there was a lot of. The 51s, P40s, things like that, over in the Philippines and uh, China area and everything, where they just dug big trenches and just pushed them off in there and covered them up. So there's been fines we, of those type of things, also. We have with us, I believe, he's in the audience, my friend from Australia. Is he here? Alan Austin. He's is at he, lunch. He was he here. He's at lunch, Bill. He got hungry. Uh, 
Anyway, he, he lives in, in Brisbane, which is southwest Australia. And I was just talking to him. They're still pulling all sorts of things out of New Guinea. And we're going to see some really interesting airplanes coming even now. I thought, you know, 40 years ago that we'd found everything that could be found. But that's not true. We're, so you know, keep coming back, and we'll try to show you interesting stuff every time you come. And I really... On behalf of EAA and the Warbirds of America, I want to tell you how much we appreciate your being here. Because if it weren't for you, it wouldn't be us. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bill.